Work is the point where we actually go about the business of serving our neighbors. The congregation is the gathering where the word of life is declared and shared. For all of its contradictions, citizenship involves all of the services of public life. Significantly, the American melting pot has attacked and redefined all of these relationships. The sexual revolution has been part and parcel of the undermining of family life. So also, for example, is the enforced movement that permanently separates most of us from our immediate families. Work has been redefined in terms that have replaced service so that, as William Stringfellow pointed out some years ago, it is now measured in terms of the disposable income to be acquired rather than the service rendered. The congregation has become one option among very many others to be consumed like any other commodity. Citizenship has been equated with entitlement. So, not surprisingly, given the priority of these relationships, what we see over and over again in our public life is the force of dislocation. People reduced to product relationships, a rampant consumerism in which identity is to be obtained in relationship to products, a situation in which, covetously, we, see, we seek to become literally what we seek. We are what we eat. Hmm? <laughs> so the most terrifying people that I meet going around the church as I have to and fro these last 30 years are elementary school teachers. I fear them. And when I meet them, I turn tail. Not because of bad memories, of which I have a few, hmm? <laughs> yeah. but because I've heard the story the country over. The elementary school teachers are the shock troops who work on the front lines of this dislocation, and they see it day after bloody day with schoolrooms overfilled with children because our society just will not pay for education anymore. They see firsthand what the melting pot has cooked up for us, a consumerist society in which literally nothing is sacred but the desires of an autonomous self. We should ask, as a wise old pastor, Judd Lindquist, once asked of an adulterous young pastor, so how are the kids? How are the kids? Thus it seems to me that the first thing we have to offer out of our heritage is an understanding of vocation. In the end, our identity is in Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. It is his gift as he frees us precisely from ourselves to call us into the defining relationships of life, into our families, to work through his spirit to gather us in congregations and finally to make us responsible citizens. In this, the Lord Jesus is literally making us some earthly good, bringing us back to the point from which Adam and Eve fell, as Luther said, or in the language of Karl Barth, restoring us to our lost creatureliness. Marriage is especially important here, and I commend to you, having looked over that fine document you're considering for presentation to the National Church, some recent literature. There's an old classic that still drifts around in congregational libraries. I hope some of you have got it as well, Bill Lazarus's early book, Luther on the Christian home, still a kind of a primer on this issue. 
More recently, Scott Hendricks published an essay in Lutheran Quarterly. It's in the 2000 number of Lutheran Quarterly, page 335 and following, if you want to take a look at it. Still another excellent article appeared in the Lutheran Forum newsletter. I'm sure some of you saw Richard Niebank's beautiful little essay on marriage, like Richard, pointed and tough. Huh? Um, he is a prophet, that guy, and one of the great voices of our church, and that is just a gorgeous little statement on marriage. Finally, though I shouldn't be so bold as to advertise my own work, I wrote an article on the same topic in the upcoming issue of Word and World um, from Luther Seminary. One of the most fat, uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the Lutheran understand, uh, um, I'm losing my head here, just a second, I'll get it back. Um, <laughs> the old uh, service book and hymnal, Philadelphia at Worship, huh? Is a direct and, <laughs> is a direct, in direct and poignant language, said of marriage that by reason of sin, Many a cross has been laid thereon. Putting sinners together belly to belly for a lifetime is a risky business, huh? <laughs> I mean, that's going to be, that's going to be the death of you. You can just bet on it and the death of both of you. Hmm? In such a relationship, we experience the daily dying, the self-loss that is inevitable in a sinful world. But just so, at the point of our crucifixion, we get a profound taste of the resurrection, of what it is to be raised with Christ. We get a taste of the age to come in the shared life, in the fidelity of marital love, in the relationship that sets up with aging parents and maturing children, in the goodness of belonging to one another inextricably. As Luther said, in marriage we literally become the faces of God to one another. We become the faces of God to one another. We are not interchangeable parts, coupling and uncoupling like so many boxcars. Huh? We are God's hands and feet, huh? God's channels. God's reproductive capacity as he creates the future of the across the earth. Partners with God in bringing in a, a new day for the creation. Not the last day, but tomorrow, which is something. We have a, we have a tradition that can thus speak of the inevitable disappointments and the transcending joys of marriage that can describe realistically what it is to die in daily life and at the same time what it is to get our tongue into the future, to get a taste of what is coming, proleptic anticipation. As my old teacher Kent Sigbert Knudsen used to say, a little pinch of the eschatological dough. Huh? <laughs> We get a taste of what is to come. Now that is a positive basis for speaking to our culture. And that, I think, is what's so beautiful about this statement that you're working on. Instead of blowing retreat every time the melting pot heats up to corrode away another restraint, we can turn to the people of the Beatitudes. The people we will speak of next week when we come to All Saints Sunday. The poor in spirit, the meek, those who have had the crap kicked out of them by a society that doesn't know up from down or in from out. Huh? Those that have been betrayed by the hopes of our culture, the false hopes of our culture, and who have, in seeking themselves have been enlisted among the world's losers. Good night, who are we for? the marginalized and the lost, huh? those who have been ground out and killed all the day long. 
But finally, our calling is the gospel. We have to ask, what is the law? Because among other things, our culture has come up with a conviction that it can be, the law can be dispensed with, put away. Creaturely life is constituted in such a way that there really are demands withstanding, the breach of which rebounds in disappointment and loss. The doctrine of vocation, so critical to our origins as Lutherans, is especially important now in the massive public dislocation that we are witnessing. But our church, like any other, stands or falls with the witness to Christ Jesus. Given what the law requires, given the significance of vocation, particularly the vocation of marriage and family, I believe that it would be a terrible mistake to continue accommodating the cultural pressure for change in the teachings of the larger Catholic tradition on homosexuality. To change at this point is to isolate ourselves from the Catholic tradition of which, of which we are and understand ourselves to be an integral part. It is to submit once more to a way of thinking that makes the self the only ethical standard. It is to entitle covetousness handing people over to their own desires. It is to take away our basis or to undermine our basis for being helpful to people who are lost in their own selves. At the same time, at the same time, the last word can never be the legal one. Christ is the end of the law that all who, may, who believe may be justified. He calls us to those who have been caught up in sexual self-pursuit, no matter what form that pursuit has taken. So the last word has to be the word that defines us. Holy absolution in its preached and sacramental form. Your sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. That, finally, is the only word worth speaking. Thanks.